dear fellows of EVA, dear guests, all of you who are here uh, at EVA in Stockholm, and uh, also you who are following us uh, online. It's a really great pleasure and privilege for me to welcome you all to EVA, the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. Uh, EVA was, of course, for about 100 years ago, the first of its kind. Uh, and since the first day, we have been building bridges between research, uh, industry, public sector, and politics. Uh, and we do it because we actually really believe in technology in the service of society, in the service of humanity. Uh, very few things today succeed without international collaboration. And I'm so happy to have so many of our international fellows here to do. Our challenges are global, and that's why also the solutions need to be global. EVA has always been international. We, our first international fellow was elected already in 1924. Uh, and after the World War II, we actually started uh, a quite a big movement, which has become quite important and an established practice in Sweden, where we sent out science and technology attachés, as they were called those days. But nowadays, I think they are calling uh, advisors or something like that. Oh. But this is a tradition, councils, you know, so it's a tradition that we started and which then has been moved on to the further on into in the society. We have today very broad international networks, and perhaps more than ever, we value this and de also depend on these multilateral con collaborations that we have, uh, both within Europe and also at the global level. And EVA, of course, with hundreds of other science and engineering academies in the world, is really, as I said, a bridge builder. And we have an important role to play all the academies together in uh, building knowledge and innovation societies. And also, as we like to say these days, uh, sustainable societies in every aspect of the meaning. So I therefore look very much forward to this seminar on technology and freedom uh, at the intersection of technology, uh, policy, and economics. And so once again, welcome to our annual meeting and this year's Science and Society seminar. And now I will give the word uh, to Maria Ranka, who also is a fellow of EVA and who will moderate the discussion and the seminar today. So Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tula, and uh, welcome to everyone to this very, very topical seminar. Uh, first of all, I have to apologize uh, because we have a slight change of the schedule uh, today. Uh, but uh, when I thought about it, I think these times that we're living in, they are forcing all of us, no matter position, no matter if we are left-wing or right-wing or who we are, they are forcing us to become more flexible. So this seminar is uh, a training for all of us in flexibility, because we had to change uh, the program. Because, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Chiang uh, was not able to come to Stockholm in time for this seminar. He is on a plane right now, so he's not able to join online either, and this was because of the COVID protocol. He sends his uh, greetings, and he is very sorry that he is not here. However, we have uh, Professor Marie-Laure Sall, who will uh, give her speech on uh, global uh, governance in times of crises. And we will have a moderated discussion afterwards, and we'll open up for Q&As will talk about exactly uh, the issues that Tula mentioned in her uh, welcome speech. Marie Lor is a, a very, very interesting uh, person with comprehensive and deep uh, experience from academia. She is, since September 2020, the director of the Geneva Graduate Institute. And before joining the institute, she was the dean of the School of Management and Innovation at 
Science Po in Paris. And she was not only the dean, but also the founder of that uh, school. Uh, she has been a professor and visiting professor in many places uh, in different countries. And she holds a PhD from Harvard. But maybe, since we are in Stockholm, even more important, she is, of course, an EVA fellow. Uh, but she is also part of the International Advisory Board or Advisory Council at the Sco Stockholm School of Economics. And she holds a uh, PhD honoris causa from the Stockholm University. So I uh, believe I can say that Marie Lore holds Stockholm in her heart. And I would like you all to uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Sal. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, and thank you so much to La and uh, all uh, the team at uh, AIVA for inviting me. Uh, it's my first time in three years back in Sweden, back in Stockholm, for the reasons that all of you can guess. Um, before that, as you can guess from my very shortly uh, summarized CV, I've been and was uh, in Sweden almost three, four times a year on a very regular basis, so I do have indeed a profound um, history linking me intellectually, but also in terms more emotionally with Sweden in general and, and Stockholm in particular. So I'm, I'm, you, you cannot believe how happy I am to be back. So thank you very much for creating uh, this opportunity. And uh, uh, the um, other thing I should say is a bit of a caveat indeed, because you know I was told this morning that I should have a bit more time and that you know uh, I would be doing this keynote on my own. So I will not be able, unfortunately, uh, to to talk about what prof what Dr. Uh, Moon would, would have talked about, that's very clear, but hopefully we can actually uh, talk about the intersection points. I'm not an engineer, this is also something I told Tula and Elin, I uh, remember very well when they called me the first time, I said, you know that I'm not an engineer, oh, but uh <laughs> so I'm definitely not an engineer, uh, I'm a social scientist. Um, I'm, it was mentioned that I'm now heading a school, and I will say a few, uh, a few words about that school. I can see an alumnus of, uh, of that school right here. It's the Swiss ambassador uh, to Sweden. So uh, really, thank you for being here, uh, ambassador, tonight. Um, the, the school, the Geneva um, uh, Graduate School, is a graduate institute, is, is, was born in uh, 1927, and it was born uh, as a in a sense, a, a follow-up, an addition to the League of Nations. Uh, the same man, William Rappart, who managed to bring the League of Nations to Stockholm, to, sorry, I'm mixing the cities now, to Geneva, uh, was also the founder of, uh, of what was called at the time Hautes Écoles Internationales, Hautes Études Internationales, and he's now the Geneva Graduate Institute. The um, identity of that school, uh, uh, the birth identity of that school is if we are going to have a multicultural, a multilateral system and multilateral ar architecture, we are going to need to train people who understand multilateral challenges and, multila and device, are able to devise multilateral solutions. And this is how the school was created with peace at, as, as its uh, main, uh, you know, um, uh, objective and international collaboration as the means to that objective. When I came to the Institute two years ago, in the middle of a, pa a pandemic, of a global pandemic, um, after, you know, we're reaching very soon, in five years from now, our 100th uh, anniversary, it felt like a good time to rethink um, who we were, our identity and our projection. And in this collective work that we engaged together with all members of, uh, of, of our community, we came up with a redefinition of our um, uh, compass um, to underscore that obviously peace was still a very important compass for us, but that today peace could not be envisioned without a focus on sustainability and equity which was uh, mentioned before. So this tri tripod has become from, from uh, that point on our common compass. 
always with the means of international collaboration, and we'll come back to that, but with a strong sense already in 2020, which is already only uh, stronger today after the, the start of, of, uh, of the war um, uh, in Ukraine, um, the, the, the strong sense that international collaboration probably has to, have, has to be reinvented, has to be transformed in the current uh, uh, context. So this is really where I'm going to be talking from from i felt it was important that you understood where uh, i was uh, going to talk from as a, a professional background i'm a sociologist as um, uh, we've you know uh, focus through my uh, different uh, years of, uh, of writing on uh, comparative uh, historical comparison of capitalism through the uh, last 150 years, but also with a focus on globalization and the governance, the global governance of, uh, of uh, globalization. So those are really the, the spaces from which I'm going to be talking about. I'm now turning to, to my, my talk, and it will be structured in three main parts. The first part is I will give you my reading uh, from where I am, again, of the spirit of the time. And all of us have our own reading of the spirit of the time, but I will give you mine, which will be the starting base from, for the next two uh, parts. The next the part uh, number two will uh, be a focus on international governance as it is now and some of its shortcomings, at least how I see them, again, from where I stand. And that can be obviously different from where um, you might uh, see it. And finally, the third part will be a few ideas on what can and need to be done. So this will be um, so that you can follow without slides my, uh, the structure of my talk. So talking and starting with the spirit of the times, I would like to propose that we are um, in a, an, a period that combines an age of fear and an age of paradoxes. An age of fear, or in fact, actually more exactly, an age of fears, uh, plural. And, and this is one of the very peculiar um, characteristics of our time. The other peculiar characteristics about uh, the fears that we are talking about, because after all, humanity has been through many ages of fears through uh, its history, is that um, some of those fears are really existential fears. They are fears about the future of our species. So one of this uh, fear is obviously the uh, environmental one, which is made up both of the climate, but also the resource um, issues. And I think we sometimes forget the resource dimension. Another, uh, this is eminently an existential fear, obviously. Um, and it's really a qu question of survival of our, of our species. A second one is uh, the possibility of um, ultimate wars. I can call them that way. Um, obviously, nuclear uh, is, uh, is the idea here. Um, a third one are still, and we've been reminded of this, pandemics. So we thought that those th things were things of the past or things at least at least for some regions of the p world that they were things of the past. They are not. So the, the fear that another pandemic is a, a much stronger one than the one we've lived uh, would come back is, is still there. And the fourth one is technology. And I will try to explain uh, what I mean by that. Technology, I'll go back to that, can be the solution and it can bring solutions. And this is something that we will certainly be discussing during uh, the, 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 the question time. But as all technology throughout the history of humanity, they can be tools and they can be weapons. They can be very positive and they can actually uh, be very disruptive and destructive. And the types of technological uh, pace that we are living, the nature of the technological transformation that we are living have on the darker side of it the possibility to question our species again. So in different ways. First, let's think about digital, the current digital impact on our democracies and possibly you know, the degree to which uh, the digital uh, transformation in the way it has happened over the last years may have uh, uh, something to do with Brexit, with um, the war in that we're currently going through uh, in Europe, et cetera, and I could, I could go on and on and on. So the disruption and destruction of democracy, uh, of our democracies, of our, of our connections, of our links, um, the destruction of a social, which is strange, and I'll come back to that, because 
those technologies should be there to connect us, but they also have the power to destroy the social. The, this is part of what I call actually an existential threat to who we are as humanity. The other side, which is maybe even more obvious, is obviously everything that is connected to um, artificial intelligence, but also to uh, the, the, move, the, the transformations connected with bioethics and, and, and the most extreme forms of those, which are to some degree uh, planning to go beyond the human, to uh, the transhuman um, movement, which obviously is a very clear uh, questioning of humanity. So we might be liking it, we might not be liking it, but the reality is that this is an existential threat if we understand humanity to be what it is now. So this, uh, you know, age of uh, fears, Connected to this age of fears, I propose that, that we are living also an age of paradoxes. And this age of paradoxes is, I'll give you a few examples. It's on the one hand, we've probably never have had in the history of humanity as much wealth as what we have today. But we are back to extreme inequalities and, and, and a very fast, actually, return of poverty to a scale that we haven't had in a long time. So we have wealth and inequalities uh, together. On uh, another example is, again, we've probably never have uh, produced as much knowledge as today. And so we are a society of very you know, uh, expansive knowledge production. And at the same time, we have never been as disinformed or misinformed as today. So we have, again, this uh, very strange paradox. And a third one, which I mentioned before, which I think is particularly important, is we've never been as connected as today, again, to the digital means in particular. And at the same time, we can see that across the world, we can see the progress of what I call structural loneliness with uh, very potent consequences on mental health uh, of the young, naturally, but actually on of, of many uh, of, of all generations. So it's interesting to think about um, the spirit of the time as this combination of an age of fears and, uh, and an age of paradoxes, because, not because from, from this we understand that actually each of those issues in itself is what uh, you know, um, um, we, could, we could describe as a wicked problem in the sense of that each of those issues is a very complex set of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, causalities um, mixed up with each other, very difficult to disentangle, very difficult, therefore, to address the issue. So, you know, we have this complexity of, uh, of uh, wicked problems, and we have a bundle, you know, a wicked bundle of wicked problems, essentially. And that's, I think, what makes to a certain extent, our incapacity to act, what explains our incapacity to act in front of that, because precisely it's not clear where to start. It's not clear how you know, acting on one dimension might unravel or, on the contrary, improve the situation on, uh, on another. So that's, I think, one of the important first things I would like to, um, to um, underscore. Three striking consequences of this combination, of this wicked bundle of wicked problems. The first one is, uh, we actually it was, uh, we got an illustration just before, but is that we are facing constantly radical uncertainty. We've moved from a century that was a century of risk and risk management to, uh, I don't know how many years ahead of us, but at least a number probably of decades that are going to be the decades of radical uncertainty. And you manage radical uncertainty times in very different ways from managing periods of risk and uh, risk management. And I can go back to that if you want in, um, in, the, in the discussions. Another um, important um, consequence of this combination, and that's, I, thi that's I think, something that we see all around us, and we see when we look at the newspaper, we see and when we look at the news in general, when we uh, look around, is the very powerful, re what I call powerful re-enclosing dynamics. We all re-enclosing ourselves. So we're re-enclosing ourselves at the level of our communities, the people who think like us, who have the same value system as, our, as us. This is obviously very strongly facilitated and, uh, and nudged to some degree by the algorithm and by uh, social networks. 
we are re-enclosing ourselves into our nations. We are re-enclosing ourselves into our regions of the world. We see the block. Uh, geopolitics re-emerging. So there's a really a process of re-enclosing that is very different from, if you remember, the 80s and 90s, late 80s and 90s, this notion that the world was flat and we would actually be all open and connected. So we have a very, very different dynamic um, right now. And I connect it to this age of fear and age of paradoxes that I mentioned. And as a consequence of that, uh, we have, uh, the very direct consequence of that is where we have the, the relative unraveling or unweaving of international collaboration. When arguably at a time, and this has been mentioned by Tula, at a time when in, by, by nature, by the nature of those fears and challenges that I you know, listed, we would need them even more. So, you know, another paradox and contradiction, which is really uh, flowing from this. So now I'm turning to uh, international governance, cur the current system of international governance, and what I see as its main issues. And again, this is really my own personal view on those things, and, uh, uh, you know, um, this, uh, this is uh, in, in no way any official Geneva vision or <laughs> on, on those issues. It's really my own personal reading of it. It's, uh, it's true that being in Geneva um, gives you a particular perspective on those things, which might be very different from when you are located somewhere else. So we, we still have, and this is very clear when you are in Geneva, especially when you are at the Geneva Graduate Institute, because you're in the middle of, of this very, very physical architecture of institutions. So when I'm sit, you know, standing on the terrace of the Institute, I can see the map of all uh, those institutions of the international governance system. So you know the WTO on the one hand, the uh, World Health Organization on the other, um, uh, the UNOG, uh, UN uh, Geneva, on the other, et cetera, et cetera, the ICRC uh, on, the, on the hill. Uh, so it's a very physical representation uh, of, of, uh, of this dense architecture of institutions. So dense architecture of institutions, dense architecture of processes, but that we know very strongly, now we know for some time, but it becomes more and more obvious every day, are more reflecting the past than the future or even the present challenges. So on the one hand, we have the political side of this system. Um, sometimes it, the, the story goes that um, the UN in New York is the restaurant. So this is the place where you know, uh, everything looks or should look nice. And Geneva is the kitchen. This is where the work is being, is being done. So the, the restaurant is in a mess. Let's, let's be clear today. The restaurant, the political side of the um, in architecture of international governance is, is in a mess. It's, it's blocked. It's quasi-paralyzed. I don't need to explain why. And um, but n I don't need to explain why at, at, at the kind of proximate level a bit more deeply, though what is very clear is that the explanation to that is that we have a system that reflects a geopolitical equilibrium of 1945. So by definition, we have a system that is totally ill-adapted um, to the current geopolitical equilibrium. So this is something that is not only conjunctural with the current war, it's something that is much more structural and that is certainly one, one of, uh, of the key uh, issues. The technical side now, the one that works, the kitchen, the kitchen particularly in Geneva, not only in Geneva, there are also, uh, you know, parts of the kitchen are in Vienna, others in Africa, etc. So, but a lot of the kitchen work is taking place uh, in Geneva. The, the kitchen works a little bit better, so that's, that's clear, but A, it depends on which issues, and B, um, it also has its many uh, challenges. And I will not go around everything here, I will only uh, focus on what I see as three major issues. The first issue, uh, which actually applies to the restaurant too, but you know, I'll focus here on, on, the, um, on the kitchen part, is the question, is the issue of legitimacy. 
We've been since 45, and, and you know, not going back to the League of Nations, but since 45, we've been um, projecting a universalist architecture with a strongly you know, um, anchored in a universalist value system and, and rule of law, um, which broadly speaking connects to European born liberal humanism, a certain set of values, a certain perspective on the world that we can historically connect to liberal humanism and to which I think probably all of us here in this room are strongly attached and, and strongly uh, believe in. Uh, and I definitely include myself uh, in that. The, this, the value system for me uh, in itself is not the problem. Uh, the problem, and this has been uh, an, a kind of layered and, and, uh, and um, aggregation uh, problem, has been the repeated decoupling between this value system, this rule of law system, and the way it's been applied on the ground in different contexts. The variability, the decoupling sometimes between the values we project and the ways in which we might go around them in certain cases and not in others, the ways in which a lot, you know, at least from the perception of a broader and broader parts of the world, there's been really a strong decoupling between us, the West, the North, projecting, projecting this set of values, set of norms, set of laws and rules and the ways in which we are indeed um, pushing their implementation in different contexts and at different times. And I don't need to give examples on this because you can find them all over uh, the press. Um, and this is really one of the major, I think it's probably the most um, problematic issue with our international governance system today. It's the one that weakens the international governance system uh, today the most. And you know, we'll see about whether or not we can still save the baby uh, when we get rid of the bathwater. The second um, major issue um, is, uh, and that might be a bit easier to deal with, is the structural thematicity of our international institutions. So our international institutions were, were born in a time when we could separate problems. So we would look at health, and then we would look at trade, and then we would look at uh, the environment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we would look at them separately, and we built institutions for each of those themes. So we clearly, from the picture that I gave you in the first part, we can see that that's good, but that's certainly not good enough, and that actually a lot of the issues now are that, that we are facing now are wickedly interconnected, and that having institutions that are thematically based is, is really not helping us so much. And a lot of those institutions that I mentioned uh, are very aware of this now. By now, at least, they're all very aware of this. So for example, Ngozi was uh, now um, leading the WTO, the World Trade Organization, uh, is very convinced that she cannot re energize the World Trade Organization, which badly need re-energy. <laughs> re uh, she cannot do that without actually completely um, connecting trade and the environment. Uh, and so she is trying to do that. She's trying to connect structurally trade and in the environment. She basically has about half of her team behind her and the other half strongly resisting this. And parts of the systems are, are behind her and other parts of the systems are creating obstacles to that transformation. So that's, you know, uh, that uh, thematicity of our international institution is an issue. And again, I will go back later in the solutions part to, to what can be done with that. One thing I should add is that we have an international organization on about on many things, but we don't have international organization with, with a strong base of, uh, of um, legal, uh, soft law instruments, etc., on one of the most important uh, themes of the day, and I already mentioned it, which is essentially the technology and the very fast-paced uh, technology that we are uh, uh, you know, having to deal with. A few weeks ago, 
Brad Smith, uh, the chairman of, uh, of Microsoft for an alumnus of my school, actually, of the Geneva Graduate Institute, um, was in Geneva, and he had been there already in 2017 to, to call for Geneva conventions on um, digital technology. Uh, he is back, and he was back with the same call, the same um, appeal uh, to what essentially would uh, amount to the creation of a, a global governance of digital um, technology, uh, but with really very uh, a very urgent, um, you know, uh, uh, speech. He was uh, saying that this, you know, I was there already. 2017 hasn't happened. This is really now becoming extremely uh, urgent. So the absence of technology for me is this last uh, third major issue. Um, with respect to the current international governance um, system. And again, we can definitely talk about that in the questions and answers. So I'm turning now to my last part, which is the what can be done and what is to be done. Um, so easily, this is the most complex part, and I'm going to, you know, uh, certainly uh, I'm not having any solutions, definite ones. I'm going just to give a few uh, ideas and, uh, and bear with me because this is really very tentative, so very happy to, to be discussing this. The first uh, things that can be done, and is already done, in fact, um, quite to some degree for the last 10 years in particular, is uh, the systematization of transversal connections with respect to the uh, international governance system. Geneva, for that, has still uh, a very strong role to play because the Geneva has the advantage to be a physical, material place where all those organizations are situated and actors convene and come to those organizations. So creating those transversal connections in Geneva is relatively um, feasible and, and possible. The way in which this has been done for the last 10-15 uh, years has been by the creation of uh, platforms, so still thematic platforms, which is interesting, but at least thematic platforms that are bringing along members of the different organizations. So we'll have a trade platform, but the trade platform will bring people from the WTO and people from UNDP and people from uh, the World Health Organization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and we'll have a health platform, we'll have, a, you know, we have almost platforms on everything, which are creating those more horizontal connections at different levels of the organization, weakening a bit the role of the state in these discussions, and having actually, and that's another very important dimension of this connectivity, is bringing in much more uh, other stakeholders, uh, NGOs, uh, the private sector, experts, academia, etc. So we are having those uh, mechanisms that are s that are you know much more flexible, much more easy to change, much more much more easy to um, to move along that have been created and that should be uh, developed. So organizational flexibility. Uh, to create um, new ideas, new sets of solutions that then get fed, fed back into the different organizations of the system. Because again, I don't think we want and we should um, you know, get rid of the baby with the bathwater. I think we have a system and uh, as much as we can try to transform it rather than totally destroy it, because if we totally destroy it, the likelihood that something will re-emerge in the current context is for me N you know, uh, no. So how do we actually transform what we have? So organizational flexibility, transversal co connections, S things that are missing at this stage is, is a kind of matrix-like connection of platforms. So the, the, you know, platformization of platforms. And this is something that, you know, we are working on, on uh, proposing uh, a system to uh, the, the Swiss Ministry uh, Foreign Affairs of, you know, uh, as a lot of those platforms are connected actually to the Geneva Graduate Institute, this notion that we could be, uh, you know, helping with the platformization of platforms, so bringing together the, the health and, and the trade and uh, uh, environment platforms uh, to talk about the interconnections of those issues is something that we are trying to, to work on. Something that is missing is, and this is something I'm saying every day, and obviously this is also where I'm 
you know, if I'm talking to the fact that I'm uh, an educator and, and a director of a school uh, explains why I say that, is the much more systematic and systemic inclusion of the young, of the young generation. How do we bring the young, not only as people sitting in a room listening to the different peoples of those international organizations, uh, explaining to them how the world is difficult and how it works and how it doesn't work, etc. But how do we actually uh, integrate in the reconstruction through those more organizational fle organizationally flexible um, mechanisms of young generations? We, we cannot avoid that. And here again, Geneva is an interesting place, and the Institute is an interesting place to, to, as a laboratory to some degree, because we have um, more than 120 different nationalities among our students. So it's a relatively small school, but with an extreme variety, um, um, diversity of, uh, of, of students. And, and we can use actually this group of students as, as you know, a, a base for, for this. So we're trying to think smart mechanisms that would allow us to indeed bring the young people um, in th that level. Uh, so that's the flexibility, organizational flexibility uh, part. Um, the second element in terms of what we should be doing or what we can do is to try and focus on what we have in common. This is a bit, you know, the way in which the ICRC, the National Committee of the Red Cross, was born was a bit that idea. Uh, it was actually, we all, you know, we could all go behind the idea that we should treat the wounded on, uh, uh, you know, battlefields. That was the starting point of uh, the ICRC. And today, there are things that we agree on. I, by we, I say humanity. I say, you know, I'm talking about the world. Uh, and there are things we are never going to be agreeing on, at least not now. Uh, so let's focus on what we can agree on. I see two, at least two things that we agree on, and hopefully maybe a third. First is the environment, is our planet and, and the resources, because we are all in this together. So this is something that I think we can agree on and try to work on. The other one is health, and we could see that uh, you know, uh, the pandemic could have been a better test case of this, of working together on this, but certainly health is something that we could uh, look as a common good and agree is a common good because this is something that concerns all of us. The third one, I would hope, but I don't think this is going to be the case, is indeed the technology um, development. And, the, and, and uh, But I'm afraid that this is the, the point where we could do this is already a bit past. I think we are not agreeing on, uh, on technology right now, and, and I regret it. And I could add a fourth one, and that's also an important one for me, I which is treating also education as a common good. But here again, I'm not sure that we all agree on that. So the first two ones for me are the places where we can try to work on uh, together. Um, so, just let me just finish maybe on um, uh, on um, two things. First, a, a few words on on um, on the technology. Uh, a few words on on you know what I see as the need to move from a perspective that has been bubbling in the last years, which is you know how do we actually indeed. Um, nudge the technological transformation towards better applications, so the tech for good uh, idea, you know, how do we use technology to solve some of those challenges? This is good, uh, this is already a first step, but I think it's not enough, we need to take the next step, and for me the next step is to think about those things in terms of good in tech, so not only having technology taken for granted, but actually bringing into the development of technology already a certain political, in the noble sense of the term, project that puts humanity, humanity anchored in its planet at the heart. Um, and therefore, rethinking the way in which we finance technology, rethinking the way in which we train technologists, uh, I, you know, one of my projects is to create a, an hybrid master where we would have uh, um, students that would be both trained 
uh, as technologists, so we would do that obviously together with a partner, probably a PFL uh, in Lausanne, uh, and as social scientists. I've done that already in Sciences Po when I launched the School of Management and Innovation. We created this hybrid master, and I think that this is really the future, is to actually um, train the future producers of technology from the start with those political, ethical, geopolitical, and governance questions uh, from, the, from the, the beginning. And that's why I call that good in tech. Last point that we have to do uh, is, and this is a much more philosophical one, but I think it's one that I'm probably the most uh, convinced about. An age of fears combined with an age of paradoxes calls for an age of courage. We have to bring back coherence, integrity, and courage in our leadership. And for that, the best way is to instill it already uh, in our students when we train them. Courage, if you go back to Plato and to, to Aristotle, is not pride. It's not exaggerated pride, hubris, or recklessness. That's not what courage is. It's reflexive, and it's measured strength. And according to the philosophers, um, courage is also necess necessarily aligned with coherence and integrity. And it is always at the service of justice and the common good. It's always at the service of the other, not of me. Courage is about the other. Courage is about us. It's much more than it is about me. And therefore, it's a social virtue uh, in, in the sense that, that it is turned to, to uh, others. So we have uh, here, this is something I want to propose, and we can discuss that. We have to augment our collective stock of courage. And the good news here, too, is that the philosophers tell us that courage is not an innate virtue. Co courage is a virtue that you can work on. Uh, courage, every time we are doing an act of, of courage, the next one becomes easier. Uh, so we can work on, we can create uh, situations, pedagogical situations, I would even say, where we can try to, to develop courage um, in our, the next generations of, uh, of leaders, something that I think we will um, definitely uh, ne need. I will finish there. Sorry, I've been a bit long, but I'm uh, very happy to take any questions and to explore a bit of those things a bit further, maybe. Thanks a lot. Uh, have a seat and a glass and of a glass water if you, <laughs> if you need. Uh, that was a lot of food for thought, sticking to your yes. uh, kitchen and restaurant uh, metaphor. Uh, and of course, I, I was almost about to ask you, if you were the chef, <laughs> what <laughs> would you serve in this, uh, this restaurant? But let's skip that. One thing. Uh, thing I, um, that came to mind when I listened to your description of sort of the status of international governance and all these post-World War II institutions and sort of how, how they are um, put under pressure to, mm -hmm. to express mm -hmm. it in a mild way. Um, and you argue for some kind of incremental change mm. of these institutions. Um, a lot of people in this room um, represents in various ways uh, uh, techno technology and uh, also business. Um, I, I myself, I'm an entrepreneur today, and, and I'm, I'm a big fan of an Austrian economist, mm. uh, Schumpeter, mm -hmm. who talked about <laughs> I see where you're going. <laughs> yeah, creative destruc <laughs> um, destruction. And you know, on the sort of tech and business side, uh, we are quite used to brutal disruption today. Uh, and that is almost the opposite to incremental mm. change. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear your arguments for why these institutions have to be treated with such care. I think it's really probably, you know, it's one of the important questions, definitely. There, there's a sense when you look at the situation and, and when you look at the misalignment between uh, the architecture that we have today and the world as it is, mm. um, where I could, you know, I could be like you and I'm like, okay, a bit of destructive creation here, creative destruction would be uh, a good idea. 
I'm very much resisting that. I've been giving a lot of thought to that, uh, very much resisting that because of the state of the world. Um, uh, if you destroy any piece of international collaboration, and I include the, the European Union in this mm -hmm. one, by the way, so I think that this all also applies at the level of a more regional form of international collaboration. Uh, if you say, okay, European Union is not good enough, it's not the one that we want, uh, let's go out of it, um, and something will emerge. No, mm -hmm. something will not emerge. Not today, might emerge after mm -hmm. another war, might emerge after another major catastrophe, but it won't emerge now. And this is true of the international architecture. Um, I think that if you go for creative destruction at this stage, you are left with nothing. And I think that what we have is still better than nothing. Uh, I think it still very much has a role to play because there's a, a space where people can talk still uh, on more technical issues. And this is where we have to be a bit more uh, intelligent. How do we still talk on, on technical issues, mm -hmm. try to resolve issues that we are all uh, in need of solution? and new solutions, uh, let's be inventive in terms of the mechanisms, let's go around the institutions, but I think going for the destruction now mm. would leave us in a, a, very, a dire state, a really a chaotic state, mm. which, um, and, and would not lead to the natural replacement dynamics mm. that uh, Schumpeter would say normally w should emerge. I don't believe in that at all. Yeah, some, some more of chaos and vacuum rather than yes. a better alternative. Uh, but so you, you label this era that we're in or about to, to enter um, uh, the time of radical uncertainty. Do you have any concrete uh, strategies for de-risking uh, in this time of radical uncertainty? Um, one would, of course, be to actually change these institutions carefully, as, as you suggested, but do you have any other sort of de-risking strategies? Well, by definition and by nature, if you go back to Frank Knight's difference, you know, differentiation mm. between risk and uncertainty, you cannot de-risk uncertainty. You can de-risk risk, mm. but you cannot de-risk uncertainty. So, you, you know, there's no strategy to de-risk uncertainty. What, what that leaves us with is, um, Therefore, the need to look at decision-making in di very different ways. Uh, so you can work with scenario, that's one thing, you know, doesn't hurt. Um, it's probable that you're out of the scenarios you're mm -hmm. able to think about today, it's not none of the ones that will happen mm -hmm. is going to be listed, but still it's, it's useful to work with scenario because it allows you to be flexible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the key. It's the flexibility the resilience, the inscription also a bit more in present than in the future, um, and, and, and the capacity to, to you know, redirect faster mm -hmm. both the decision-making and the organization, whatever organization we are talking about. And so it's true that it's easier to do that with smaller organization than with the type of big organization that we have in the international governance system. Um, but you know, what I see also is that in the world of, of academia, you also have a lot of big or big universities. There was a time when we thought that big was beautiful, and uh, my my thinking about those things today is that actually, in in the context of um, radical uncertainty, small is beautiful um, and because at, at least creating smallness within the big, you know, uh, that might be one way in which you can transform the big into uh, a more flexible and more uh, adaptable organization. And that's what should be done, I think, also in those big organizations mm. that cannot be uh, downscaled. I want to come back to, to technology and freedom, the very sort mm. of headline of, of uh, tonight's seminar. Um, have you seen any examples or do you have any ideas of uh, how technology and innovation as such can support free open societies and also resilient societies. Mm. Well, you know, the, the, the problem is that I, I, co I often use the notion of, of the Janus. That's mm. what technology is and it has two sides. Mm. So the same technology can mm. free us 
And on the other hand, it can be a source of control, surveillance, yeah. uh, you know, so we, you see what I'm yeah. talking about. So digital technology on the one hand allows us to opens worlds to us, it opens capacity to organize, it opens capacity to talk, to cross borders, etc. even when we cannot physically cross borders, uh, it opens uh, the doors to knowledge, uh, and on the other hand, it opens the door to fake news, and it opens the door to um, uh, states controlling mm -hmm. ourselves, uh, controlling us, mm -hmm. or, or even private GAFAM mm -hmm. firms con con controlling us. So. I think any technology has the potential to be uh, mm. enhancing freedom, but it also has the potential, like mm. Phi, think yeah. about Phi, you know, the first technology, the first technology yeah. of humanity. Phi is great because it allows you uh, to cook, it of allows you to... Of course, but provided at least I, I am in the freedom yeah. Camp, yeah. and I think most of the gang here they are in the freedom. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, in, and Eva is definitely in the freedom yeah. camp. Like, yeah, uh, no, tech, that's what I said. Tech, we all I think tech for good, as yeah. you labeled yeah. it. Or good in tech, good in tech, <laughs> and, and tech for good as well. <laughs> uh, but but so, you know, what are the examples? How can we, you know, and also in governance terms, what can we actually do to to get more of that? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing. I think that we, we've, we've let go of... Um, I believe that freedom never goes without governance. Mm. I think that, you know, this is, I think that's an important uh, um, claim. Maybe not everybody agrees. But I think that um, freedom without a degree of governance will end up into non-freedom. Uh, so bringing in governance at the right time is mm. key. And I think we missed a bit that step particularly with the digital and the World Wide Web. Uh, so we have other technologies that are becoming big today, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, um, the biotechnologies, etc., which potentially can be highly enhancing and also mm -hmm. highly destructive. Uh, and so we should get into uh, the governance exercise as fast as possible. This is really essentially what Brad Smith was actually telling us. Please, yeah. guys. Yeah help us regulate ourselves, you know, help us. Um, and, and one of the, uh, the, 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 the key sign when, when it becomes a bit late is when you start moving toward an, oligo uh, an oligopolization like we have today in, in the digital world of, of uh, actors. So, uh, you know, as much as you see that happening, you know that it's starting to be a bit late. So still possible, has to be multi-stakeholder, but we have to frame, basically, those technology to nudge them into the direction of freedom. I don't, the freedom will not survive on its own. So I want to open up for questions. I think there are microphones. There are microphones uh, on the sides of your chairs, if you have any. Questions. What I wanted to get at was the idea that we don't have time, in my ah. view, for us to wait for the children, and we don't have time mm -hmm. to transform the institutions. And what I was attracted to in the Millennium Goals was that uh, Kofi Annan privatized an effort. Mm -hmm. It didn't wait for research to figure out what would work. It just went out in the field and tried to do projects that would prove concepts and then brought the public sector in to see what would happen and then tr let the public sector move things using industry. And the industry was crucial in all of this. So I was wondering if you could think about whether there's a solution that would move things a little faster than what you've said so far. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I was never, I was never saying that we should wait for the chi children to, to, to find the solutions. I was just saying that around the table, we have to have the young people um, in, in one way or another, and which we don't have so much in international organizations. So that was uh, the only thing that I was saying on that. I think, yeah, I think the Millennium Development Goals and Agenda 2030 are, are very important. And they are, they're very important as, as framing exercises because they are now, in a sense, a bit the compass that we are all thinking about in terms of. They have, s ha however, they have some of the same limits that uh, of, uh, of what I mentioned before in the sense that they are also extremely thematic and, and they don't so much actually um, um, talk about the interconnectivity of those uh, of those issues, and so they are to some degree they have their limits too as instruments. Even though 
again, better than nothing. Totally agree with you that solutions, the next generation of solutions, and um, you know, this is the types of discussion we, we were having with Brad Smith, have to be multi-stakeholder. And where they definitely have to be multi-stakeholder, as I said before, they would have to be very flexible organizationally. Uh, so the Geneva Convention notion that he's uh, proposing, uh, Brad Smith, and that I think I, I kind of like, the Geneva Con Convention for Technology, uh, is an interesting idea because it's a very soft um, instrument. Uh, it, it has to be built multi-stakeholder, um, and so it has to have everybody around the table. Uh, but as he himself said, um, there, there also has to uh, a need for, for things to, to, to be more than just soft nudging and to, to turn things more into faster action. And this happens through transformation of also incentive systems. You know, we're thinking about, for example, the next wave of sustainable finance. If you are really, if we are really serious, this is also something we're working a lot at the Institute on. Uh, if you're very serious about sustainable finance, one of the key um, ways that we can accelerate that is by the transformation of, of incentive system uh, in uh, the banking sector, but also at, uh, at, the, the, um, at all levels, in fact, in reality. You know, I think that that's also a discussion that is interesting because we've been having it for now 10, 15 years, is how, how do we get multi-dimensional um, um, measures of progress, you know, not simply economic progress, but multi-dimensional measures of progress, which then become the driver of very different policy making at the national, regional, uh, city, or even transnational level. And, and those instruments, they exist already. Huh? Uh, we have those kind of multi-dimensional uh, um, measure systems, but we, we need to accelerate. I, I, I still think that the, the, the way in which we are being trained, have been trained um, and are being trained is important there. The way in which we look at the world, our perspective on the world is really an important element that will lead, hopefully, the generation who is now entering the job market more in that direction. Uh, Marilo, we're running out of time, but yeah. I want to have you don't want to ask your question. If it's brief, you get to ask it. Thank you. Well, then I'll connect. I think that there's a nice... Uh, you're talking about both the multi-stakeholder and the, you mentioned the capacity to redirect faster, actually, to address mm. uncertainty. You need the experimentation, so mm. I appreciate that comment. So what would be your recommendation? That, because then the feedback loops, mm. the learning, just mm. to make the, re the redirection possible, what are your thoughts on the most effective learning mechanisms in this type of thinking? In this type of uh, thinking, yeah. Excellent uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do think that the collective dimension, and this is why also I would very much um, militate for not throwing the baby with the bathwater, I do think that the collective uh, peer level um, learning, peer level <coughs> co-direction is an important one. So I, you know, I can see this when we, when we create those, those moments, like in, in you have this regular yearly um, building bridges <coughs> event in, in, uh, in Geneva, which brings together the bankers, um, and uh, not only the Geneva bankers, but like bankers from everywhere, and international organizations, uh, as well as academia experts, etc., around um, you know, discussions and topics. And, and just by bringing this variety of people together uh, in good faith uh, around really important, urgent issues and with the good faith on all sides is, so, is really leading. I can see that one, one event after the other, it's leading to learning on all sides. So I think that uh, creating, and this is, again, this is something that the Institute was also born for, to create actually spaces for this types of very good faith discussion and debate around urgent and important issues, respectful discussions around urgent and important issues. I think this is a key mechanism. This is the key mechanism that is, uh, since uh, Socrates, huh, in the sense of uh, how you learn, is by, uh, really um, 
pushing people to listen to each other and to try to, to uh, add to their own perspective the perspective of the neighbor. And so I think any space that does that uh, and allows us to do this is really today, first, rarer and rarer, we have to realize this, because most of the spaces that we occupy tend to, on the contrary, re-enclose us, as I said at the beginning. So there's a tendency to re-enclose us in circles where we are not being confronted to different perspectives. So any space that does that on practical issues, technical ones, you know, uh, things that we can solve, where we can try to find solutions, I think that's, that would be my answer. And on that philosophic note, I would like to invite the ch uh, chair of EVA, Marcus Wallenberg, up to the stage. So, uh, dear friends, Marie-Lou, thank you very much for uh, coming here, giving us this fantastic insight uh, in this evening. I, it's, it's a huge topic, of course, um, and uh, I wish that we will have political leaders that has the courage to deal with it. Because uh, as it goes right now, it seems to me that the value-based system that we are used to uh, is certainly not at its highest inflection point. It needs a lot of encouragement uh, from very brave politicians and leaders to, 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 to deal with it. And um, I, I would say that the analysis that you gave was absolutely brilliant, very, very interesting insights. Many aspects that you, may, you have not touched so much about but uh, that we, we need to deal with uh, at the same time. But for Eva, um, who is really at um, the, wishes to be at the forefront of technology, society, and business, this was certainly an evening to remember. Uh, so thank you very, very much. And thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Uh, and uh, I wish you a very good evening. Thank you. And, and of course, many thanks for, to Maria, who always, who, who tried to get uh, a bit of destruction in there, but you didn't <laughs> succeed completely. <laughs>